Hello my loves and welcome to yet another episode of The Strange Playgrounds, an episode that is bang in the midst of that peculiar desolation that lies in between Christmas and New Year's Day, where there it's a kind of empty space, it's a null space, where nobody knows where they are or what day it is and everything is really rather confusing. It's the kind of liminal space that I like to operate in, quite frankly. Um, I was very fortunate this Christmas because I managed to get um, from my parents both the Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 art books, the concept art books for those games. Uh, not only are they stunning volumes in terms of their production, but the artwork of these games is as impressive as what derives from it. It got me to th leafing through them is inspiring. The images in these books is phenomenally inspiring because they are like captured crystallized stories. The artwork, like the scenes in the games, has this quality, a very particular quality that I always look for in artwork, which, which suggests mythology and narrative that occurs outside the frame of the painting. Painting. It suggests that what you've got is a snapshot, like a frame of a film or something to that effect, it, that there is something wider happening and you need as the audience, as the observer, to put it together yourself. I adore that kind of art and I adore that kind of storytelling, that kind of indirect atmospheric storytelling, which the games themselves emphasize so well. One of the things that I love about the games, above and beyond anything else, is that they don't necessarily have clear narrative, they don't have clear plots or even back mythology. It's all very vague and kind of confusing, but deliberately so. It's not because of poor delivery or poor conceptualization. They're actually very, very advanced, these games, in terms of their narrative, in terms of how they convey what is happening, what the backstory is. There's a kind of in-media res situation where most of the time you're dropped into a situation that is ongoing, a mythology where, certainly in Dark Souls, all of the really significant events have already happened. The world is already dead. The the grand narratives, the sort of big mythological stuff has already happened and you are nothing but a bit of grit in it. And you need to figure out what has happened and why. And you need to do it for yourself based on lots of different factors like recurrent symbolism, very vague clues in items and architecture and geography, the, the, the even the placing of creatures and characters and monsters, that all ties together together to create the back mythology within the mind of the player, within the mind of the audience and the observer. And that is a very advanced form of storytelling because what it does, it trusts in the sophistication of the audience's imagination. It doesn't feel the need to explain everything and to spoon feed you with every little detail or to control you, to control the way your imagination works. What it does, it gives you just enough bits and pieces, enough in the way of implication to cobble together your own very particular mythology. And that what that means is that every player, every audience member, will have a slightly different experience and will have a much more personalised experience of that narrative, that mythology and that story because they'll bring their own biases and their own interpretations and the, the state of their own imagination will come to play. And I find that wonderful. That's a kind of storytelling that I absolutely adore in any medium. It's very, very, very difficult to achieve because it's sophisticated. It's phenomenally sophisticated. It's particularly difficult in non-visual media. Video games are particularly good at this, I find, because video games are unusual as narrative devices. They still haven't, they're still evolving, for one thing. They still haven't really found their ultimate state of play. They still haven't reached a point of saturation yet in the way that perhaps more traditional media has, arguably. Um, there are still wild and grand experiments occurring in the, the, the nature of video game narrative. Because video games are necessarily immersive and because the audience necessarily has some degree of control of how the narrative pans out, really good writers and video game creators can manipulate that. They can use it to tell very personalised stories, very sophisticated stories, whereby everything is ambiguous, everything relies upon what the player brings to the table. 
And I really love that. I really love it. And there are some very key examples of that out there. Um, the Dark Souls series is obvious. Bloodborne, even more so, I would argue. Bloodborne is beautiful for this. The, the way it implies narrative and back mythology is unbelievable. Especially through its visual design, through its atmosphere, this kind of atmospheric storytelling, I just love to bits. I love it to bits. But you also have things like, for example, Pathologic, which is one of the finest examples of this, and not only utilises it... Um, to the nth degree, but it understands how it works. It understands how it works in such a way that it even dines to make the game itself negative, to, to induce negative feeling in the player in order to place them in particular states of mind. So when they're interpreting the symbolism of the game, they will be in this frame of mind or that frame of mind. They will be in a particular emotional state. That is phenomenally clever. Some films do it too, some TV series do it, but they are very difficult to find and they're very hard to come by. The likes of David Lynch films, are really good examples. There's a heavy reliance on symbolism, recurrent symbolism, sound design, implication and inference. Uh, when you watch a, a, a piece of David Lynch work, then you have to engage with it. It forces the audience to do a bit of work. That's what I really like about this kind of narrative. It treats us as consumers, as audience members, with a degree of sophistication. Instead of treating us like idiots and like children that require to be spoon-fed every detail and that need to be corralled and controlled in terms of our imagination, it trusts us. It places trust in us that we can interpret abstraction, that we can engage with subject matter to such a degree that we can put work in to get the best out of it. And those are always the best narratives. They are always the best narratives. There is a reason why when these narratives, when these, when these types of media hit, they hit hard. They develop a cult following. Uh, the reason is that there is an appetite out there for it, despite what popular media would have us believe, despite what culture would have us believe, that we're all idiots, we're all children, we all need spoon-feeding with soap, opera, lipstick on the cup style storytelling. We don't. There is an appetite to be treated like adults in this regard. And it's essential. It's absolutely essential for us to engage with these kinds of exercises because this is how we understand what stories are. This is how we understand the mechanics of storytelling and of exegesis and of interpretation. This is how we understand how meta-narratives work, not only within media but within culture, within wider processes and systems and traditions. It's how we understand how narratives and mythologies are utilised by certain forces, systems, powers that be in order to manipulate us, in order to reinforce certain uh, situations and status quos, and in order to bring about new ones. It's essential that we understand that, especially in this day and age where uh, what markets itself as news media lies to us so consistently. It creates its own fictions and its own narratives that we are expect expected to assume and swallow. It's in the only way we can recognise that, realise it, and, and understand when we are ensnared within them, when we are trapped within those particular assumptions and meta-narratives, is by exercising our own ability to engage with those narratives. And then we are able to dissect them, we're able to pick them apart, but also to understand our own reactions to them. That's why this kind of narrative is so important. There's, it's, I would argue it's much harder harder in written fiction. Much, much harder. Because you don't have the automatic, um, sort of the automatic situations provided by a visual environment or by visual characters. You, you don't have to waste time describing them or setting them up when you've got a video game or a film or a TV series that just shows you them. Uh, particularly in video games where you can just wander around and engage with them as and how you wish. In literature, 
in written fiction, you've got to exercise something very, very difficult, which is you've got to understand how the audience's imagination works and how much you can you can give them without it becoming impositional. What kind of framework you need to provide in terms of environment, character description, the little clues as to what mythology might be occurring or what situation may be occurring, and how much of that is too much and how much of that is too little. It's very bloody hard. It's something I wrestle with all the time. I mean, my, I really try hard with my fiction not to ladle too much into the audience's lap. I don't want them to feel... I don't want to write something like, for example, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, for all of its strengths, you know, this is, not, this is not an attack or an assault upon The Lord of the Rings. It's a different kind of fiction. It's not the kind of fiction I like to write. But The, the Lord of the Rings, because Tolkien had such a clear idea and had put so much work into his back mythology, he knew exactly how he wanted the audience to interpret and imagine it. So it is explicitly detailed every tiny element is given to you that's not the way i write that's not what i do with my mythologies i often understand what i'm putting into the stories i often know what my interpretation of them would be because there is often a back mythology that pre-exists which i understand which i've written down elsewhere in notes or whatever but i don't give that to the reader I don't give that to the reader explicitly, often. You'll get names, you'll get implications, you'll get concepts, and then I leave it for the reader to interpret, because I like that. I want to know what read what stories readers are making in their own heads from what I provide and I love that. I absolutely love that. And having had feedback from various different people on what they take from the fiction I write, I, I and when it's so so beyond my own ability to imagine when it's when it's stuff that comes from their own emotional and inspired lives i absolutely love that because what that means is new stories have been created from what i've provided and that is that's essentially all any any imaginer or any writer can ask for i love that to bits it's something i really strive to do and it's not something everybody likes it's not something everybody likes i mean my, the most consistent bit of feedback i get from my my work that is that I suppose could be taken as a criticism or as negative is it was too abstract for me it was too sort of out there for me which is perfectly fine that's perfectly fine it's useful it tells me what the parameters are and it also tells me what my audience is it tells me where my audience is because the people who get it get it hard they really do the people who don't get it probably won't ever because it's just not their kind of fiction and I I totally appreciate that i really do my stuff is never going to be for everyone it really isn't it's very very particular very particular and often requires work to engage with just like the dark souls games do just like uh bloodborne does um just like a lot of work does but you will i promise that if you do you'll get something out of it um, or at least I endeavour to make sure people will get something out of it. It makes writing it a really interesting exercise because it's a bit more like poetry than prose. Um, and that, again, requires... It requires some input that a lot of readers and writers don't necessarily have in that it requires you to have a background in poetry. And I write poetry as well. I really, really enjoy poetry, but I enjoy consuming it. I enjoy reading it to the nth degree because I think that poetry is the highest form of written media. It's the highest form of written media in that it is the most elegant, in that it requires the greatest sophistication of its readership and of its writers. Um, it requires interpretation in exactly the, an engagement in exactly the same way as the stories that I'm discussing here. And I like that. I like that a great deal. Something I can get my teeth into. Something that will reveal facets and potential interpretations the more I gnaw on it, the more I turn it around in my head like a puzzle or a prism. I really love that. I really love it. It is something that 
And not to sound sort of too old man about it, but it's something that's very difficult to find these days. Particularly within genre fiction, there is this tendency for genre fiction to be very narrow, for assumptions of it to be very narrow, particularly since because of the proliferation and the opening up of markets, people can now just go and get what they assume they like. They can, for in horror, for example, people can just go onto Amazon and type in body horror. They can type in zombie apocalypse fiction. They can type in uh, splatterpunk fiction, and that's what they'll get. So what they're being fed, what they're consuming, reinforces what they assume of those genres and of that type of fiction, rather than questioning it, rather than opening them up. And often that process is quite painful. I'm sure we've all done it. I'm sure everyone out there has had that experience of reading a book or a story that they didn't like initially until they came back to it later. And then they understood. Then they had the context or the maturity or the, the development in order to engage with it and understand it. I've done that many, 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 many times with many forms of fiction. Dostoevsky was like that for me. Shakespeare was like that for me. Um, Frankenstein was like that for me. A lot of fiction that I now regard as more or less sacred was like that for me. The most, some of the most important fiction I've ever read in my life was like that. And in that regard, it's worth putting the effort in. It's worth discovering the fiction that challenges us or that opens us up to new contexts. It's absolutely necessary. In this day and age, right now, given the state of what is called news media, given the state of our discourses, our meta-narratives, it's essential for our abstract survival and indeed our actual survival. Um, it's something we all need to learn to do, whether we want to or not. Otherwise, we are going to find ourselves consumed by it on one level or another. Um, we are going to find ourselves infested and manipulated by it, by those who do understand it, but don't understand its value outside of control and maintaining authority and states of privilege and whatnot. Um, so, yeah... It's just a form of narrative, atmospheric storytelling that I cannot do without. It's something I adore probably above and beyond any other quality in fiction. And it is phenomenally hard to achieve.